The righteous run to it and are safe. Well, I want to say good morning to everybody. I want to welcome those who are watching on YouTube this morning as well as those who are listening on KQAD. Why don't we stand and greet each other this morning as we get ready to sing together. Our first hymn this morning is number 44, Children of the Heavenly Father, number 44. Our next hymn is number 372, Living for Jesus, number 372.
I'd invite you to be seated and join me in our congregational prayer. Well, Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning hour and we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our everyday lives. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. We thank you, Lord, for your abiding presence that walks with us day by day, that you are there to coach us, encourage us, and to help us say no to the temptations that we face each and every day. And Lord, we know that in the past week we've failed in that department. There have been things that we've said and done that we were tempted to do that we should have said no to, but we went ahead and and did them anyway or said them anyway. Well, Lord, we even failed at times to do what we knew what was right. So, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that you would provide for us freedom from those failures. And we're grateful to know that you promised that you will. And so with that assurance of knowing that we are forgiven, we can move forward. And we pray, Lord, that the next opportunity we have, we will listen closer to your will and that we will walk in your way and that we will not succumb to those temptations. We're grateful, Lord, that you are merciful and gracious, that you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that you don't deal with us according to our sins, nor do you requite us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your steadfast love towards those who fear you. And as far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our transgressions from us. And Lord, there is so much peace that comes out of that psalm in our lives, knowing that we are forgiven people, that you don't remember our sins any longer, and that you sent your son into this world to pay for them. And so Lord, we pray that as we go about this coming week, that we will look to you and then we will walk in your way. And we, Lord, we know that there are so many things going on in our lives, cares and concerns that we lift up to you. We think of those of our church family and our community that are battling cancer. We pray for Erwin Bonestro and Shirley Hogeveen, for Shane McMath, Rick Tatchy, Randy Van Mon, and Sheila Viss, Joel Wester, and Ken Winterstein. And we pray, Lord, that you would give them victory over these diseases, that you will continue to provide them for the strength they need each and every day. We pray for their doctors and their nurses and fill them with wisdom and help. We pray too, Lord, that you'll be with others who are battling illnesses and sicknesses. We ask, Lord, that you will strengthen people each and every day, fill them with your peace and fill them with your love. We also lift up to you, Lord, the the Vanderwerd family as they've been mourning the loss of Dorothy. We pray that you will strengthen them as We celebrated her life yesterday here at church, and we ask, Lord, that you will continue to watch over them. We also pray a prayer of praise that Leah Hansen and um, her baby were able to come home from the hospital this week, and we ask that you would continue to provide strength for that little boy and, and for his mom, Leah, as well. We also pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over um, churches that are in need of pastors. We pray, Lord, for um, our church as we seek someone to uh, come alongside of us and to work with us in full-time ministry as an associate. Lord, we ask that you would uh, bring people in into uh, interview, and, and we pray that you would raise up a search committee that would uh, provide wisdom and guidance for this process of hiring. We also pray, Lord, that you would be with churches worldwide who are in need of staff and leaders, and we ask that you will continue to provide them. We thank you for your faithfulness in raising leaders up thus far, and we pray that that would continue, that soon every church in in the Midwest Network would have found um, people to fill their, uh, their ministry roles. We also pray, Lord, that you will continue to raise up Uh, leaders in churches to go out and share the good news and invite people to be a part of our 
uh, life and existence. But we don't pray that prayer just for the church in Steen or just for the churches in our area. We pray that prayer for churches worldwide, that church people would rise up and say that our world is in need, our world is hurting, there's wars and rumors of wars, there's problems, there's pain, there's suffering, and the answer to all of those things is a relationship, Lord, with you. And so we pray that we would um, bring hope and help into the lives of others. We ask, Lord, for our missionaries, Brian and Beth, Tom, Jeremy and Susan, Reed and Lacey, and Mike and Elvira, and we ask, Lord, that you would strengthen each of them Give them what they stand in need of. Fill them with uh, strength and peace and, and help them to minister in a unique way in the places that you have, have uh, placed them in the world. We pray for strength of their ministries and we pray for strength of heart. We also pray for our local missions. We ask that you will strengthen the missions of uh, Atlas, New Roots, Rock Ranch, Game Plan for Hope, and also Center of Hope. And we pray, Lord, that as a church... We will be good ministry partners with these local missions, that they will uh, be good, and, the, and we will be good uh, citizens working with them and, and sharing um, and encouraging those that lead those ministries, but also partnering with them in any way we can to help them. We pray, too, for the work we do in our everyday lives, whether we work in a hospital or a nursing home or if we are in a school or driving a, a truck or driving to uh, different places to, <coughs> be, to, to sell items or whether it is working in a, in a business, in a community or working from our own homes or uh, whatever it is, Lord, that we do. We ask that we would do it for your honor and glory. Fill us with your uh, ability to, to do things for you and not for ourselves. Help us to see that that is the way you've called us to live. We also ask, Lord, that you would help us to be strong and to be faithful. We pray, too, for our governmental leaders, that they would be strong and faithful to you, that we, they would listen to your will. And, Lord, if <clears throat> people refuse, we ask that you would remove them from the offices that they hold and replace them with someone who will listen to your will and walk in your way. We lift up to you our servicemen and women. Keep them safe. And we ask, Lord, that you would provide for them wisdom. We, we pray for their families, as oftentimes they're separated due to their military service. We also ask, Lord, that you would continue to watch over those who are elderly and shut in. We ask for people who are living in assisted living, independent living, or the nursing home, that they would be strengthened by you and, and given what they stand in need of each and every day. We lift up to you specifically Anna Mae Burkhorst, John Bosch, Anna Schallenberg, Dora Steffen, Gert Steinberg, Trudy Tooney, and Ferd Tilstra. Bless and watch over them. We pray this in your name, Heavenly Father, as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I want to invite the kids to come forward and join Stephanie Rosenboom uh, for our children's message. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody today? Good. Good. I have a little game for us to play. So I need two volunteers. Let's take Harper and Bryce. Um, let's see. I'm going to give you, you can take a handful of the foam balls and you take a handful. Okay. Then I need, can you guys... Can you guys sit over here and watch? We're going to have Bryce and Harper stand out here, okay? Um, the goal is for you guys to be able to 
toss the balls into the buckets, okay? Okay, can you, can you guys back up just a little bit so they have room? Does this seem easy enough to get and toss the balls in the bucket? I think so? Okay, well I, gotta, I have to do something first though. into the bucket. Go ahead. Cohen, can you go pick some of them up for me? Lincoln, yeah, you can help too. Oh, he made one. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to help Bryce out just a second. Okay, let's have Bryce try again. There's a few more. Okay, Harper, we're going to give you a few more. You got this. Here we go. All right, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Bryce, if you need to step up a little bit to get them in too, you can. Okay, so now that I helped you, why don't you help Harper? All right, so um, you guys can sit down. It was still a little bit difficult to get the balls in the bucket, but was it easier without your blindfold on? Yeah. Um, so two things we're going to talk about. If we remember, we pretend that we have our eyes on our bucket, right? When you took the blindfold off, you had the eyes on the bucket, and you were focusing on the bucket, trying to get the balls in the bucket, right? When you had your blindfold on, could you see anything at all? No, it was dark, right? So did it help to be in the light to see where you're going to put your ball? Yeah. So if we pretend that our bucket here is God or heaven and that we're focusing on that, right? And God is the light and that we're going to focus on the light and that we can see and that we know our goal is to eventually get to God and to get to heaven. But we can't do that on our own, can we? No, just like you guys couldn't do it on your own with the blindfold on, you needed the light and you needed to be able to see, right? So we need to remember to fix our eyes on God and let him help us so that eventually we get to our goal, which is heaven and to be with God. And the other thing I was going to talk about was I helped you, Bryce. I took the blindfold off, right, so you could see. And then I asked you to help Harper. So... We all know God, and we know that God is the light, and that our goal is all to get to heaven, but we need to share that with others. So once we know that, and we have God in our hearts, we want to try to tell and help as many other people so that they can take their blindfolds off too, and that they can see the light and have the focus of God. Okay? All right. Let's all bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each one of these kids that we are able to come here today to worship you and fellowship with one another. I got, ask God that you be the light in each one of these kids' lives, that they may look to you and fix their eyes on you, and that when the world tries to keep them in the darkness or Satan tries to keep them in the darkness, that they can remember that they always have you to look to, look to and to lean on and that you are the light of our lives and that we can go and share that light with others. Amen. As the kids are headed back to their seats, you can open your Bibles to John, or 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 through chapter 3, verse 7, which is page 1,900 in your pew Bibles. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 through 3, 7. As we get prepared to read God's word, let's go to him in a time of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that we can read it, we can study it, that we can hear what you have to say to us. So Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our eyes, that we would understand what these words say, 
and that we would hide them in our heart and put them into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 and following. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But what we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right, what is right, is righteous, just as he is righteous. So ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Well, if you remember last Sunday, we were invited to walk in the light, follow in Jesus' footsteps. And in the light, well, things might seem scary there. Because things are exposed. Uh, Everything in the light can be seen. Every wrinkle, every problem, every issue. In the light, nothing can be hidden. The other day I was working on something and I was using my impact sockets and they're all black. And uh, on those impact sockets is etched what size socket it is. And... Um, the older I get, the harder it is for me to read on that black surface what's etched in that black surface. So I need to go in the light. If I'm in my garage, I need to go outside in the sun, and then I turn the socket, and then I can read exactly what it says etched on that socket, what size it is. The light helps. The light exposes. But again, that seems to us scary, especially if there's things in our life that we want to hide. But God is inviting us to walk in the light. Really what that is for us, and we're going to look at this a little bit today as well, is a search for identity. Who are we? Do you know? What's our identity? What's our, what's our name? Who do we belong to? Each of us has a name. If I walked around uh, the church this morning and asked you what your name was, uh, I'm guessing that's an answer that you could all give me, right? Lowell, what's your last name? Bonama. And so you belong to the Bonamas, right? And there's a history there. There's a family. There's a lineage. I'm, my last name is Wiersema. There's a There's a history there. There's a lineage there. And you can trace it back. In fact, some people do. They do their genealogies and they look back and they look back to where their families originated from, where they came from, at least as far back as last names and tracking that sort of thing has been the case. My wife, Amanda, her maiden name is DeGroat. So you belong to the DeGroat clan, right? And if we traced her lineage back... We could go back to Holland and we'd find out that she's as free as I am and, uh, and that both of our parents are stubborn. Um, anyway, the uh, reality is there is a lineage that each of us carries, a family name, and we know it. 
I think can remember conversations with my dad growing up about names and identity. But one thing I do remember that was very interesting to me was when I got a little bit older and I got my driver's license and I'd go out and I'd spend time with my friends. Before I left the house, my dad would always say to me, remember who you are. Remember who you are. And my dad wasn't talking about being a weirsma at that point. Did you know that? He was talking about me being a son, a child of God. So you and I need to hear that same advice that my dad gave me. Because I asked him the first time, Dad, what do you mean remember who I am? How can I not remember who I am? And he said, I want you to remember whatever you do, you're a child of God. So every time after that, when my dad said to me, remember who you are, I knew exactly what he was talking about. So for us this morning, I want us to ask that same question. Let's remember who we are. What's our identity? Where do we belong? What's our family name? So let's begin by asking this simple question. How does God see us? Now that we're in the light... Now that we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus, how does God see us? Maybe that is a scary question to think about as we reflect back on all the things that we've done in our lives, all the things that we've experienced, all of the mistakes that we have made. Our minds quickly go there when we're standing before a righteous God and we wonder, how does God see us? Well, let's study 1 John chapter 2, 28 through 3, 7, and see exactly how God sees us. Our passage begins in a, in a very interesting way. It says, and now, dear children. Why didn't God just say, people of God? That would be inclusive. Or what about men and women of the earth? Or maybe we could simplify it a little more and say, um, folks or use guys, right? But God chooses a specific thing. He says, dear children. Why does God use that term? Why not just, hey, you, listen up? Why, dear children? What does it mean to be a dear child of God? Think about that for a moment. As we're thinking about that, I want to share with you a little bit of Greek. I know I don't do this a whole lot because I'm probably the only one in the congregation that's ever been forced to study Greek and learn how to read it. But specifically in this passage, that word or that phrase, dear children, comes up a few times. And children specifically, what is there? In Greek, there's a number of words for child or children. There's a specific one used here and it's called technon. That's the Greek pronunciation of the word children. That particular Greek word technon has a meaning behind it, a specific meaning of a child and it's actually a begotten child. Meaning one that you've given birth to. Technon. God is saying, dear begotten, dear beloved, dear children of mine. There's this kind of envelopment of family, of personalness that comes with this particular Greek word. It's really significant when you think about it. Technon isn't just like, oh, there's some kids playing over there, you know, kids. These are terms of endearment. This is a term of endearment, meaning this is a personal term. God is looking at us, and he's specifically calling us his very own children. That's significant. It's it's blood relation. It's, It's a my flesh kind of thing. It's that particular connection, that deep love 
that parent has for child. The other night, um, we got together with family, and uh, Amanda's brother and his wife just had a baby boy, and uh, Colton is his name, and Colton was just screaming his head off for probably about 25, 30 minutes. He was just not a happy little man, and little man, is he's only about yay tall right now. He was just not a happy little man. He was upset, frustrated, all kinds of not happy. You know, Colton being less than a year old doesn't have the ability to tell his parents with words at this point what's going on in his life, but he just wasn't happy, and that's pretty clear when a child cries. But it's interesting to watch a mom and a dad respond to a child's cry, how personal and how loving it is. Now, I want us to think about that. How does God respond to our cries? And how do we see God responding to the cries of his children throughout Scripture? And, and sometimes, you know, we don't always understand when we read the stories of like the Israelites and how they cried out to God and why they were upset about some of the certain things they were upset about. But we can see that God responds to their cries in a loving, parental, and personal, flesh and blood kind of way. So when we hear dear children here in 1 John chapter 2 and 3, I want us to listen to this personally. Like God, your Father in heaven, is talking to you face to face as an earthly father would talk to his child or an earthly mother would talk to her child. God is motivated here to call us his dear children by his deep and real love for us. We're his authentic family. In fact, he's the one that breathed life into our lungs. So God says, he invites us actually in the next part of our scripture passage to continue in him. What does that mean, to continue in him as his dear children? Well, what God wants us to do is experience life in him, to be his, his kids, to experience what it means to be a child of God. Not just some, some out there kind of, well, you know, I'm a child of God as some designation, but to really experience what it means to be a child of God. That identity, that family name. God is inviting us to experience experience that in a very real way. So how do we do that? Well, think about it. God's provided everything for us. God, in fact, is pointing to a never-ending relationship with us. We'll always be his children. Always. No matter what age we are, no matter how long we've lived will always be God's children. And isn't that true for all of us? How many of us here are children of our parents? Seriously, there's some of you not raising your hand. Where did you come from? There's no stork, by the way. Your moms had you, sorry to say. You did not just appear one morning. But honestly, we know what it's like to be a child. We know what it is like to be identified with a family, to have a name, to be connected. We know what it's like to live in that way. And God is inviting us to live in that way with him. Now, this just isn't some, like, experiment. This is a forever kind of invitation. God doesn't want us to just live in him or continue in him for a moment in our lives or for a time in our lives. But when God invites us to continue in him, it's a forever kind of thing. Like when we breathe our last breath in this world, fine. But that doesn't, that doesn't stop us from continuing in him, from continuing to live with him for all of eternity. That's the hope that we live with. So God is inviting us into this new way of life. And of course that means if we're going to continue in him, we've got to live, well, live in the way that God wants us to live. So that means that there's definitely going to be some, some changes 
in how we live our lives. That means that we're going to have a new set of priorities. We're going to have a new set of experiences. We can't go and live in the darkness or walk in the darkness or be in the darkness any longer like we talked about last Sunday. We've got to be people of the light. So if we're going to continue, then that means we've got to continue to follow him, continue to walk after Jesus day in and day out and never stop. And what that means is that God has given us the opportunity to live a radically different life. And that's the good news. Because now we have a new nature. Now we have a father that we'll always have that will continue in relationship forever. Well, there's something else that God is inviting us to, and that is to be confident and unashamed as his dear children. Do we see that in our passage? In that very first verse, that we will be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. What does that mean, to be confident and unashamed? Maybe that's not what we were expecting. You know, sin is something that causes shame in our lives all the time. When I sin, I'm not proud of the fact that I've sinned. In fact, I'm ashamed of some of the things that I've done, the things that I've said, the ways that I have been. Shame is something that all of us understand. But God is saying, no, no, as my children, as this new uh, identity comes over you, as you continue in me, I want you to be confident and I want you to be unashamed. Well, that's a big change. You know, we know that our sin has made us feel the same way that Adam and Eve felt, and that was we got to hide, we got to cover things up. And God says, no, no, don't cover up. In fact, be honest. Expose the wrong for what it is and say it and label it for what it is and then continue in the light. Walk in a new way. Walk in the ways of truth. Don't hide, but be honest. Be confident and unashamed. Confident and unashamed because because Christ has changed us. It changes everything. Boy, that's something our world just doesn't understand today, does it? That people can be changed, that they can be made new, that they can continue on confident and unashamed, knowing, yes, they had a past. Yes, their past was filled with wrong, but they have a future, they have a hope, they have a new life that God has provided for them, but, but it requires us to be vulnerable. Being confident and unashamed does require that. Being confident and unashamed it means that we are dependent on God's mercy and that the shame no longer controls us. And now we have a new family name that we can be proud of. I think that's important for us to understand. How does that work? I'm sure if you did enough digging in each of our past, we can probably find some relative that each of us has, different relatives, that each of us has that didn't do everything right in their life. They weren't walking in the light. In fact, they were walking in the ways of sin and darkness. I'm confident that, that all of us have someone in our family's history that that's been the case. You know, Jesus did too. Did you know that? Jesus had some pretty seedy characters in in his family lineage. You know the the lady that everyone talked about from the town of Jericho, you know, when the walls came tumbling down, Rahab the prostitute? Did you know that she's one of Jesus' relatives? That's pretty shady, isn't that? Then there was other people that that Jesus was related to that didn't always do things like King David is one of Jesus' relatives. And you say, oh, no, no, King David was a man after God's own heart. He was immoral. He had an affair with a lady named Bathsheba. Remember that story from the Bible? That's pretty shady. I mean, we all have people like that in the past in our family name, but God redeems us. God redeemed Rahab, the prostitute. God redeemed David, the adulterer, the murderer. And God redeemed us. 
changed our lives, gave us a new name, gave us a new family, one that we can be proud of because now we're born of God. Our passage here in, in 1 John chapter 3 points out to us that, that God's love for us is great. God's love for us is so great that the word became flesh and he dwelt among us, in fact. God's love is so great that he solved our sin problem, that he solved our shame problem, that he in, transplanted into us the power of his amazing grace. And God invites you and I to experience an abundant life with him. God reveals to us that now the Father in heaven is our Father. And we're loved. We're loved. Tremendously, we're loved. Think about God's incredible capacity to love for a moment. He loves me and he loves you. He loves so many. And all of us aren't perfect. All of us have faults. All of us have foibles. All of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Nothing compares to the greatness of God's love. In fact, our passage says the love of God has been lavished on us. I like that word, lavished. What does that mean, actually? There's a root to that word. So what does it mean, lavished? I mean, how many of us have heard of lavish things before? All of us have, right? Some of us live in, in, in plain houses. Some of us live in lavish houses. Some of us have lavish cars, fancy cars. Other ones don't. We know what that is. Some people have lavish tractors. I'm going to let you decide if they're the green ones or the red ones. Or the blue ones, that's totally up to you. You can fight about it in the fellowship hall later, farmers. But lavish something or another is something we have an experience with. But, but what does it really mean? The word really means at its root that something has been poured out upon. So it's like an excess, right? God's love is poured upon us in excess. That's what the Bible is saying. Like we can't take it all in. It's so much it spills all over and all around us. That's the image of lavish love. How many of us have ever been, and it's been a while, but how many of us have ever been soaked in a pouring rain before? I mean, it's been like a year or two since we've been out. And so I've been soaking wet. I've been out in the rain. It's rained so hard that I have just been soaked to the bone before. That's the image I want you to plant in your mind, that God's love comes in so hard, so fast, so full, that we are soaked to the bone in it. Wouldn't it feel good to be that soaked again once, have a rain like that? Absolutely. That lavish love, that, that soaking, is the word that's being used here. And it also points us towards the cross about Jesus' blood being spilled out for us in a lavish way. It's an expression of God's love. It's an expression of helping us understand the price of God's lavish love. And guess what God's love does? When it's lavished on us, it makes us unrecognizable to the world around us. Has that ever happened to you where somebody hasn't recognized you from long ago in your past? Or better yet, has somebody run up to you and started talking to you somewhere and you're standing there talking back to them and you're like, I have no idea who this person is. And they're talking to me like I'm their best friend. Has that ever happened to any of you? Yeah, it's pretty funny stories usually that go along with that. But think about that. Those people are unrecognizable to us for one reason or another. They know us, they know who we are, but we don't know who they are. 
That's what God's love does, makes us unrecognizable to the rest of the world. We're so radically changed. We're so uh, immersed and poured over in his lavish love that people don't even know how to engage us anymore because it so changed us. Now, don't be shaken by that reality, folks. The fact that we're unrecognizable means that that God's transforming us. The old self, the way we used to do things, is in the past. And the new self and the new way of doing things is the future. All the scars that we used to carry have been fully healed. I know there's a praise song out there called Scars in Heaven. The only scars in heaven, it says, are the ones that Christ bears. I can't imagine what that will be like. Brad, you and I will get rid of all our saw marks. It'll be wonderful to have a pristine body with no, no scars. Imagine how God changes us. I mean... We become unrecognizable because we don't bear the marks of sin any longer in our lives. We're, we're going to be flawless. That's what our passage is pointing us towards, that we're on the path to living a flawless life because of God's lavish love. God has snatched us from the grip of death, and God has given us a life that will last forever. And the world looks at that and they say, well, that's impossible. But everything is possible with God, our Heavenly Father, because we're His children. So here's what it means for us. We've got to start embracing this new identity as the children of God. Well, how do we do that? What does that all mean? Well, that means we have to start acting or being like our father. I had the opportunity over the last few months to do some premarital counseling with a couple who is friends with my son, Joshua. It was a lot of fun. Well, anyway, <clears throat> the first night that I uh, did premarital counseling with this couple, the young lady who I didn't know very well at the time, looks at me and says, I can tell you're Joshua's dad. You act like him. <laughs> Joshua, I act like you. <clears throat> but honestly, we start to bear a resemblance, and that's what we're talking about here. If we're going to embrace our identity as children of God, then we have to embrace the fact that we're going to start looking like him, acting like him, being like him we got to be like the Father because He's made us purified. He's made us holy. And <clears throat> this process, theologians over the years have labeled in, in two categories. And they're, they're bigger words. They're justification and sanctification. We're justified or justification happens on the cross with Jesus dying there. His blood washes us clean and we are made pure there by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been justified. Our sins have been paid for on the cross. And then there's sanctification. Sanctification is that process that we begin to live into where the Holy Spirit comes and works in our lives and begins to change us and make us into that new creation, change our identity, make us look more and more like our Father, act more and more like our Father every day. And that process of sanctification happens our entire lives in this world. Until that day we come to stand before Jesus. When that process has ended, and we will be just like him. And we'll fully live into that new identity. And our, our family name will be fully seen in who we are. That process of sanctification is what you and I live in each and every day. Praise God for his love. passage ends by saying no one who lives in him keeps on sinning lawlessness is no longer a viable option for our lives well that sounds is that even possible 
We wonder about that. I mean, we all make mistakes. We all miss the mark from time to time. Well, of course, that's why Jesus died on the cross, so that we could be saved through his grace and, and through his work, because we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. It's not of ourselves. It's what God has done for us, what Christ has done for us. But the promise here is this, that there is going to be no sin in us. There's no need for there to be sin in us. In Christ, we will have the power to resist the temptations and the sins that come our way, and that is great news. I mean, you and I don't need to take a master's class to know what sin is. I've got a list here I'm going to share with us this morning. And I want to see if there's any of these. And this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, if you disagree with any of them. We know that malice is a sin. Murder is a sin. Coveting is a sin. Sexual immorality is a sin. Abuse of any kind is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Gambling is a sin. Using illegal drugs is a sin. Hatred is a sin. Favoritism is a sin. The list could go on and on. We know their sins, right? We know it. It's not a shock. I mean, it's like driving down the road, getting pulled over by a sheriff's deputy, and he says to you, you're speeding. Your response isn't, oh, I didn't know there was a speed limit. Because all 40 billion of the signs that have posted the speed limit, I haven't seen. We're not dumb, are we? We know what sin is. And I wish I didn't know. But every time, even from when I was a little tiny kid, now maybe not a baby like my nephew Colton, but any time, from the time I could understand and communicate, I knew when I was doing wrong. I knew when I picked on my sister in church to make her make noise to see if I could get her in trouble with mom and dad and I was hauled out to the furnace room and got to hang out with the boiler for the rest of the sermon that I was wrong. Sin is not a surprise to us. And we don't need to live like it's a surprise to us. We know what it is and we know those are the things in our life that we need to resist. We need to say no to us. None of us is shocked by what sin is. And here's the good news. Now, none of those are part of our new identity as dear children. That is not who we are. Don't be defined by your failure. Be defined by your father. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us to be defined by you as children of God, dearly loved by you. Help us to live in that way. It's so easy for us to give in to sin, but no longer. We want to have this new identity and we want to experience it to its fullest. So Lord, we pray a surrender to you this morning. Listen to all of our hearts that we no longer want to be be defined by our failures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite the deacons to come forward as we uh, take our morning tithes and offerings, and I'm going to share a few announcements while they're making their way forward. Monday night is the elders' meeting at 7 o'clock, and consistory is at 8. On Saturday morning, um, there's going to be subs made. And so if you'd like to sign up uh, to help the mission committee do that, um, you can do that. Um, They're going to make them at Tom and Dolly's place at 8 o'clock. And so don't forget to sign up so Tom and Dolly know you're coming. Also, we have a piano to give away. So if anybody would like a piano, an upright piano, talk to Tammy or myself if you're interested. And then uh, Consistory is looking for volunteers to help start and lead a junior high youth group. And finally, uh, mission of the month is um, Inspiration Hills. So uh, don't forget about uh, supporting them. And the flowers up front are from Dorothy Vanderwood's funeral, which we had yesterday. So thank you to the family for sharing those with us this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gifts that you give to us. 
and that we're able to give them back to you. So we pray that you will use them and use us for your honor and glory and the furthering of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 447, Freely, Freely. Receive now the Lord's benediction. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our closing hymn is Make Me a Servant. <laughs> 